I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, she's going to be talking about wolves of the sea, orcas and their specialized feeding strategies. Brittany Munson is joining us from Southern California, where she works at the California Science Center as a senior educator. Brittany received her bachelor's degree, uh, bachelor's of science degree in aquatic biology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has a diverse background of science and educational experiences. She has worked in the Bahamas as a coral reef ecologist, in Alaska as a naturalist, and most recently she has worked as a science communication fellow on the EV Nautilus in Central Pacific. Brittany is very passionate about communication, conservation, and education, and hopes to encourage and inspire people of all ages to stay curious and keep exploring. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brittany. And if anybody has any kiddos around who would like to join, this is going to be an appropriate presentation for the young ones out there. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Justine. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, thanks for having me again. Like I'm, I'm going to be doing a presentation today um, on orcas, wolves of the sea. My friend Justine um, contacted me and asked if I would do a presentation for this. And I was like, I don't know much about wolves, but I know something about orcas. So here's what I'm going to be doing. Um, yeah, so let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen here. So I hope you all can see it. It seems like you can. We can see it. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So again, the title of my presentation today is Wolves of the Sea, Orcas and Their Specialized Feeding Strategies. And before I get started, I did want to do a um, land acknowledgement. So I acknowledge that I live and work on the homelands of the Chumash native peoples who have called this area their home for many generations. I acknowledge their presence here and recognize their enduring connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. So a bit about me before I jump into the orca stuff. Um, so as Justine said, I got my degree in aquatic biology um, and I went to UC Santa Barbara, uh, but I've been pretty much obsessed about anything ocean related ever since I was really little. Um, <laughs> so there's me being a naturalist in Alaska. I did that for a couple of years. That's me doing some coral reef ecology and restoration work in the Bahamas. And that's me, and you might recognize this person here. Um, that's Justine and our good friend, Andrew. Um, so I worked and volunteered at a local aquarium um, here in Long Beach for a long time. And yeah, so I've just always been really, really interested in the ocean. Um, as it said in my intro, you know, conservation and uh, just learning and exploring. Um, but by no means do I consider myself an expert. So <laughs> if I misspeak today or if I give wrong information, I hope that you'll forgive me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I consider myself a dabbler. So, um, but I have always, always, always been passionate about whales, specifically orca, ever since I was really little. So, hopping into a little bit of background about killer whales. Um, there have been so far 10 ecotypes that have been identified. And as far as I know, scientists are still working to determine whether or not those ecotypes can be even split into specific, um, maybe different species. So there are there is genetic variation between these ecotypes. Uh, they don't communicate with each other. They don't interact with each other. It's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so again, there are these 10 that have been identified and have been kind of studied so far, but for the purposes of this presentation today, I'm gonna to be focusing on these three. Okay, so we have the uh, resident killer whales, um, and so there are northern and southern resident killer whales. I'll get into that a tiny bit more in just a moment. We have the um, offshore killer whales and also the um, bigs, transient killer whales. So residents here, the um, the bigs here, and then the, the uh, offshore here. So it's kind of obvious to see the differences 
in the different types of killer whales and the previous poster that I shared. But then if we just narrow it down to these three, they have very subtle differences. So when we talk about offshore, um, generally those killer whales are going to have like pointier, more triangular dorsal fin in relation to the resonance or transients. And also a big thing is that they have a um, a more faded saddle patch. So that kind of grayish area behind their dorsal fin, we call that the saddle. Um, so that's what they have there. So pointier fin, more faded saddle patch. Whereas residents, usually their dorsal fin, especially if they're female, they're gonna be a bit more curved. And in addition to that, a huge tell that they're a resident pod or a member of the resident pods is that they have the an open saddle patch. So you can see that the kind of coloration is a bit more swirly. There's like the black going into the into the gray. And then with transients, um, typically their dorsal fin is going to be a bit more hook shaped, I guess you can say, at the top of the dorsal fin there. So again, very subtle differences. Um, and again, I'm not an expert, but the experts and the researchers who spend a lot of time out there on the water with these orcas have been uh, very quickly uh, or very quickly able to identify and determine the different ecotypes that they're taking a look at. All right. So again, like I was saying, there are different ecotypes and ranges. So if we're looking specifically on the West Coast here, um, we have offshores, residents, again, we have the northern and southern, and then we have transients. So the northern, of course, are a bit more in the northern Pacific, whereas the southern are, you know, more in, uh, oops, excuse me, in this region here. Um, so yeah, northern residents, there hasn't been as much work done on them. I think the southern residents are a bit more or I would say the most research and the most is known about them. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of differences between the Northern and the Southern that have been discovered so far. So again, the title of this presentation is, we're, we're gonna be talking about the different uh, strategies that these different types of orcas use in order to hunt and catch their prey. So. Um, how do these three hunt? And so as it was mentioned earlier in the introduction, I'm an educator at the Science Center. I work with little kids, so I'm a little intimidated doing this presentation. I hope there are kids joining today. I don't know. But um, I wanted it to be a bit more interactive. I know that you all can't really directly chat me or anything like that, but hopefully we can still get some participation, maybe from you, Justine. I don't know. Um, but I wanted to test your knowledge and put your skills to the test. So if you can categorize which orca is which, which one is resident, which one is the offshore, which one would be a transient. So I'll give you a moment to think about it. Folks can uh, put their answer in the chat if they'd like. And I'm sorry if you hear a car alarm in the background. <laughs> I do work in downtown Los Angeles. And so <laughs> there's a lot of uh, ambient noise going on. So we do not hear a car. Okay. <laughs> Good. Is it cheating to ask if we can see the the slide with the differences again? Not at all. Yep. Let me go ahead and go back to that. So here's this one here. All right. And I Thank got an you. answer in the chat. Somebody wrote to me and said, left resident, middle transient, right offshore. All right, let's check and see. So left trans, left resident, middle transient, right offshore. And the answer is resident, transient, and offshore. So yay, good for you. Thank you so much for participating. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about these um, ecotypes and how their um, hunting and feeding strategies differ from each other. <laughs> All right, so first starting off with those residents, this is gonna be another participation 
points, right? So residents, do we think that they eat pizza? Do we think that they eat Skittles? Or do they eat fish? <laughs> Barbara says Skittles. All right. Any other guesses? All right, Linda says fish. Excellent. All right, so let's go ahead and let's see what we got. Yes, residents eat fish, right? So specifically, they prefer to eat salmon. Um, specifically, they're wanting to eat what's called king or chinook salmon. Um, so yeah, so um, a trick that I learned when I was working in Alaska as a naturalist is how to kind of remember or to, yeah, how to remember the different types of salmon that are around, right? So I'm going to kind of do a little segue here and teach you all the, the hand rule, okay? So the five general types of salmon that can be found within the waters that the residents feed in, um, you start with your thumb. <laughs> and the word thumb kind of sounds like chum, right? So that is chum salmon. And then the pointer finger, if you're not careful, you might poke yourself in the eye or sock yourself in the eye. So sock eye salmon or red salmon. Then the middle finger, that is your largest finger. And the largest salmon is the king salmon or Chinook. The ring finger, sometimes people wear silver rings on the ring fingers, so that would be for silver salmon or coho. And then lastly, the pinky. So the pinky is the smallest, and it's also for the pink salmon, or they're also called humpy. So that's a cute little way for you to, if you don't already know, the different types of salmon and how to remember them. Um, so anyway, uh, the resident pods, um, they prefer to eat specifically king salmon. That's why it's wearing a little crown. And their uh, tooth shape looks like this, you know, so they're a bit more hooked towards the end. Um, they are very, very vocal. So they have almost like distinct languages. Um, so scientists are listening in, they have hydrophones and they're trying to able trying to be able to determine what is it that they're saying, what is it that they're talking about, how are they communicating with each other? Um, so you can see that data here. They have different dialects. Um, so with the resonance, I should have mentioned this, there's the J pod, the K pod, and the L pod. And within those different pods, they have different um, ways of communicating within their pod too. And then something interesting that I told you I would mention before. Um, so males hunt more than females. So again, we have the Southern residents and we also have the Northern residents. So with the Southern residents, males are hunting more than females, but with the Northern residents it's actually switched. It's the opposite. And so I don't know if there's been any uh, determination as to why exactly that is, but I just thought it was kind of interesting to note. Okay, excellent. So that was some information about those residents. So again, their main food source is the Chinook salmon. And I'm going to talk about that in, um, towards the end of their presentation a little bit more. But if we're moving on, we have this one here, right? So does the transient orca, is it interested in eating cheeseburgers? Is it interested in eating cereal or seals, sea lions, otters, those kinds of things? Okay, Linda said seal, sea otters, sea lions. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so again, with those transients, they um, prefer to eat other marine mammals, okay? So the majority of their diet is going to be sea lions, seals, other whales, um, dolphins, porpoises, sea otters. Um, occasionally birds, okay? So that is a difference between the transients and the resonant pods. And again, you can see that their tooth shape is different too. So they're definitely more 
pointy rather than being kind of like that hooked shape that the resonant pods have. And um, as opposed to the residents who are very talkative, you know, they're constantly communicating with each other, even when they're hunting, the transients prefer to rely, they rely on stealth. So they're a bit more silent as they're hunting. But then um, it's been observed that after they have a successful kill, then they, I guess, kind of celebrate in a way. And so they're a bit more vocal and um, making a lot more noises that way. Um, yeah, so the vocal behavior of transient killer whales is significantly differ different from that of southern resident killer whales. While fish eating southern residents call to one another during foraging, transient killer whales remain silent in order to successfully surprise and catch their marine mammal prey. And yeah, so then their method of taking down their prey, they're, you know, that's when they use tail slapping. I'm sure some of you have seen videos of them using their tail to punt their prey way, way out in the water. It's pretty amazing that they can do that. Um, body slamming, ramming, those types of things in order to um, immobilize their prey. All right. And then next we have the offshore killer whales. So do we think that these killer whales eat soup? <laughs> do they eat chocolate? Or do they eat sharks? <laughs> Somebody said clam chowder. <laughs> sharks. OK. Yeah, so let's go ahead and see what these offshore killer whales are eating. So I would say that these are probably, from what I understand, maybe the least um, understood of the three killer whales that I'm talking about, the three different types. So offshore, yeah, they like to eat sharks. That's um, mainly what their diet is. Um, yeah, so these, again, these pods or these ecotypes don't interact with others. I don't, there are some times when the pods come together and form something called a super pod. I don't know if the offshores do that as much or the, um, or the, transients, I think that the residents do that um, a bit more often, but again, the residents are studied a bit more than the offshore, the transients are. Um, yeah, so during those times when they're in their super pods, they may share food, they may not. I, I don't know much about that, sorry. <laughs> but I do know that the offshore prefer to eat sharks. Um, and so if you take a look at their teeth here, as opposed to the um, residents and the transients, over time, their teeth get worn down because I don't know if any of you have ever touched a shark before or touched shark skin. Um, it feels way different than ours does. So they have these teeny tiny little um, formations on their skin. They're called dermal denticles and they're basically like teeth on the skin of the shark. And so when these killer whales are constantly eating these sharks over the years, their teeth get sanded down, basically. Um, and specifically, the part of the shark that these whales are interested in eating is the liver. So there have been, um, especially recently, um, so off the coast of southern, uh, or excuse me, of South Africa, there have been, there's been a huge increase in the amount of sharks that are washing up on shore who have had their liver almost surgically removed and slurped out um, by the orcas that are hunting in that area. I've been, I remember hearing that their names are uh, starboard and port <laughs> because their dorsal fins kind of one leans to the right. So that's starboard and one leans to the left and that's port. Um, a little segue there. But yeah, it seems like offshore orca who specialize in feeding on sharks they prefer um, eating the liver of the shark. And that's because of the rich nature, the rich nutrients in that organ, um, in addition to the squalene uh, that the liver has of the shark. So yeah, that's how those eat. So again, I was just focusing on those three specific types of um, those ecotypes. Uh, but again, if you remember uh, on that poster that I showed at the very beginning, there are lots of different 
types of orca. And so there are some in Argentina. You may have seen these on documentaries. I don't know if for whatever reason the GIF doesn't seem to be playing. But um, these orca are specialized in being able to successfully beach themselves in an attempt to get um, sea lion pups. And then that's how they are able to eat. Whereas the other orcas that I showed you, like a resident or a transient or a uh, offshore, they wouldn't be able to do that and be successful, right? So it's a very specialized method. And then the ones in Antarctica, um, they work together to kind of make a pressure wave of water that's able to wash off um, any prey item that they're seeking on an ice float. So like seals, um, maybe penguins, right? So they're able to work together and coordinate in order to make that uh, really coordinated effort to make that pressure wave to wash off their prey. Okay. So I did want to spend some time talking about uh, revisiting those resident orcas. So again, I talked about resonance, um, transients, as well as offshore. Um, so with the resident pods, those ones are actually considered endangered. Um, so if you take a look at this uh, chart here, you'll notice if you take a look at the orange line, so this is the total of the J, K, and L um, individuals together. Whereas this uh, darker orange color, that's the L population. The yellow one, that's the, um, the J population. And then the green one, that's the K, right? So we can see that overall, there's been a steady decline in their numbers, which is not good. But the one that's been the hardest hit, it seems like, is the L pod. Um, and like I said earlier, these residents, they prefer to eat Chinook. So if you take a look at this map here, um, this shows where they tend to do their feeding and the different uh, times of year that they tend to do their feeding. And you can see again that most of the time they're seeking that Chinook uh, salmon. Um, but the issue is there's um, a lot going on that is causing those Chinook salmon numbers to decline. Um, so there are dams in place that are um, that are disrupting the life cycle of those Chinook, and so their numbers are decreasing. Um, in addition to that, um, not just with the Chinook, but also just contamination in general. So that making its way into the ocean, that's having an effect on these resident pods. Um, the increased amount of, you know, well watching vessels and people not doing well watching in a responsible, respectful way. Um, so all of these different types of factors are having a negative impact on these resident, um, these resident whales. And again, so we are seeing that reflected in their numbers that they're slowly declining. So I just wanted to talk about briefly, you know, what can we do um, in order to, you know, what, what little can we do uh, individually that can make a, a bigger change, right? So again, like I said before, the, some contributions or some contributors to decline are the contaminants, um, right? So people not disposing of waste or chemicals properly, and that makes its way into their, um, into their food supply, um, vessel traffic, noise, um, and then again, prey availability, right? It's just, just dwindling. So um, I do enjoy whale watching. I, I go whale watching uh, fairly often, but I try my very best to make sure that the companies that I go out with are doing so in a very responsible, um, respectful way. And actually when I was working up in Alaska um, as a naturalist, um, the vessels that we were using were uh, we were practicing whale sense, right? So all of the naturalists, all of the um, people on the vessel, the captains, we all went through a course um, and this was sponsored by NOAA and the Whale and Dolphin Conservation. So we were able to, um, we were able to make sure that we were following all kinds of guidelines as we were looking at the whales. And so these were mostly humpback whales. You saw um, killer whales occasionally, but mostly it was humpbacks, but just for all marine mammals, right? We wanted to be practicing uh, that whale sense standard. 
Um, in addition to making sure that you're whale watching responsibly, um, you can also be making sure that you're eating responsibly, right? So um, in my opinion, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, their resources are excellent. So if you are going out to restaurants, if you're buying seafood, um, they have these really convenient like wallet size cards that you can keep um, in your pocket or in your wallet. And they give you information about the different options that you can have. Um, so options that are maybe not so great, you wanna try to avoid those ones. Some ones in the middle that are like, okay, depending on the method of capture of that type of seafood. And then some that are the green light, you know, they're sustainably, they're sustainable, they're um, caught in a sustainable way, um, environmentally, environmentally friendly, things like that. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is an excellent resource. And then in addition, there are all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of petitions and conferences such as this one, right? I know that this one specifically is for whales, right? But just for, you know, conservation and awareness and getting attention um, out there to the general public, right? So um, there's this one, the Mimi Poo. I'm so sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, um, but they happen to have a petition um, for uh, getting rid of the dams that are, some of the dams that are um, impacting the Chinook salmon um, in the area where the uh, those rising night killer whales are residing. And, you know, so hopefully get just raising those, raising that awareness and getting those voices heard. Um, those are some of the ways that we can help out those populations. Okay, um, so that was my presentation. I hope that it wasn't too simplistic. 